Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our season finale for the Spring Sport edition of Longhorn Weekly, heard all across the state of Texas and the great Southwest on the Longhorn IMG radio network and viewed by those of you watching right here on the Longhorn Network. So we've heard from all of the coaches throughout the course of this academic and athletic school year, so maybe it's only fitting that we cap it all by hearing from the man in charge of it all, Athletic Director Steve Patterson. It's uh, great to have you with us, Thanks. And, and I guess I should start off by saying, are you finally settled in as as <laughs> has life as well as the job settled in for you now yeah it's been uh, roughly six months and uh i think we got through the football transition and and uh, the spring sports and we're even the postseason here uh, with the spring sports and uh, uh heading towards the summertime we got through graduation over the weekend which is good and uh, so I feel good about where we're headed right now. How was your house hunting experience like? I that? think Did we you... might be there. Really? Because <laughs> that's an adventure in the Central Texas and Austin area. It is. I tell you, it's it's a it's a seller's market around here. <laughs> <laughs> what what were the first few weeks like for you in just getting, uh, you know, might say the the lay of the land? I mean, you you'd been here 30 years before as a student as well, and obviously very familiar with the area. But until you settle in to work professionally and try to live and settle down, that's a completely different kettle of fish. What, what, what was it like for you the first few weeks and first couple of months leading into it all? Well, it was great to be back. You get, you get uh, reacquainted with a lot of folks that uh, maybe in many cases you haven't talked to in 30 years. Um, it's great to be back on the campus. A little bit of, you know, wow, when you look at the changes and uh, a little bit of wow when you look at the changes around the city. Uh, particularly with the changes in downtown. But, you know, then you go get to check in at Matt's El Rancho or a few other of <laughs> your favorite barbecue joints and and uh, and you feel back, you're back at home. You know, uh, the, one of the things that uh, folks have talked about, about uh, having you as athletic director is the fact that it's a guy with familiarity of, of, of the lay of the land. And like yeah. you said, there's some things that change. And we know Austin is an incredibly growing, vibrant city as well. But you seem to get pretty comfortable pretty quick around here. Well, the first football game we were here for, my wife and I actually started touring the suites about two hours before the game and didn't get back to the AD suite till uh, halftime. So you, you sort of forget how many people you know. You know their kids, you know their grandparents, you know their grandkids, um, and you get a chance to, to talk to them. So haven't spent a lot of time working in Houston for a lot of years, living in Austin for eight, nine years, and uh, doing a lot of work in Dallas. You, you, know, you, you start to realize how many folks you really know around here. Now, having said what we said, it's certainly about football, uh, the, the other big thing that's got a lot of folks excited in these parts and really all across the state of Texas is the Coming On Strong Tour. And you've been able to be on uh, several of those dates as well. Yeah. Uh, it's been a really unique and novel concept. What, why this? What, what was the, the, the impetus behind this tour and your, your evaluation of the tour throughout the course of the spring? Well, really it had been 16 years till, uh, since the school had done a tour like this when Matt came here and he had a great long career. And so it was a chance for to really reconnect with the donors in a lot of the communities, with the alumni in a lot of communities, with the high school coaches, with the fans uh, on the street, and to be able to talk to a lot of the press in those marketplaces. So um, it's been phenomenally successful over the course of the last month. Uh, 13 cities are going to fly over to we got Beaumont and, and Waco as the last two uh, stops. You know, Charlie was the one that wanted to add uh, Lubbock and Waco. and. Uh, I told him, great, <laughs> let's go ahead. <laughs> and uh, But whether it was down in the valley with all the great families we had there or with uh, 1,100 folks in the Reliance Stadium in Houston or the great turnouts in Fort Worth or San Antonio or Midland, anywhere it's been sold out everywhere we've gone, uh, really, I think, energized a lot of the fan base around the state. Uh, got a chance to meet our supporters and the media in, in all those marketplaces and really tell the story of Charlie Strong and why we hired him and where we're headed with the football program. Well, that was where I was going next, the message that was coming from the tour to the fans and, for that matter, the feedback you've gotten from the fans yeah. at these tour stops. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun just to, to meet people from all walks of life in, in each of the towns. But really, we wanted to let everybody know about how alive and vibrant uh, we are, and you know, particularly with the football program. We took a number of the other coaches with us on a number of the stops. Uh, Rick was with us on a few, Karen Ash and others. Um, so you get a more rounded view of the department as a whole. You know, it's one thing to communicate via the media or, or social media or, or otherwise, but 
you know, when you get to shake hands with the coach and the assistant coaches and and uh, a number of the different uh, personnel related to each one of the teams, I think it, it has a more direct connection for folks all over the state. You start to see the real depth of uh, the fan base across the state. And I think it was it was uh, uplifting for the staff here. And and I and I know it was for a lot of the folks uh, around the state just getting the feedback from them. All right. Now, you, you were a Houston guy and an Austin guy. So. Were there any of these stops you, you hadn't been familiar with, places like Amarillo or down in the Rio Grande Valley and uh, those some of, the, some of the more remote spots along the way uh, that, that were kind of new to you? No, I, I, you know, I, I, I lived in Texas for 30 years, yeah. so I, I mean, I've covered most of the state at different points in time. You know, it was fun actually to see how some of the markets had changed or some of the new buildings. It was kind of fun to be in Corpus Christi and see the new Whataburger Ballpark, and which I hadn't had a chance to see before. And, uh, you know, you see some of the boom that's going on in McAllen, and uh, uh, it'll, be, it'll be fun to be over in Beaumont this afternoon and, and, uh, and, and uh, at the uh, Texas Sports Hall of Fame in, in Waco. Uh, I just, I think, was most impressed with the fans all over the, all over the state. And, uh, you know, it's just great to get out of a chance to get around and, and, and touch everybody. You know, as, as a builder of facilities as you have been, do, do you, when you go into places like that, <laughs> look at facilities and you're kind of looking at, at with, a, with, a, with a critical eye or, or at least a, a, an assessment of the specific athletic facilities in some of these places you've gone? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, people ask me, do I like going to sporting events? And it's, it's really not uh, relaxing for me because I wind up, you know, looking at the signage, looking at the concession stands, looking at the security, uh, where are they taking tickets, how they design this place, how many suites they got, what are they selling them for, what do the signage look like? Um, so you see all these facilities and you try to learn from them because every generation of buildings gets, gets better because they get to look at the last ones that got built. And uh, I think they're also kind of fun to look at in terms of what they reflect about the city that they're built in and the different cultures of, of the towns the different important things that go into uh, each one of those towns and what their decision criteria was for their facilities. We welcome you back to Longhorn Weekly. Craig Way with you, joined by Steve Patterson, the Athletics Director at the University of Texas. I, I mentioned that we were going to talk about your assessment, your thoughts on your athletic programs. Now, it's pretty easy in the layman's terms or a fan's definition or even a media's definition to assess success of athletic programs. They look at the left column, they look at the right column, they look at <laughs> W's and L's and W's and L's, and that, yeah. that seems to be uh, the, at, its, at its core uh, that the fans or the media's definition for the assessment of success or failure with an athletic program. What, what do you think, uh, A, in the macro, an athletic director's view of the assessment of success of an athletic program is, and be yours in specific. Well, I think it can vary from from university to university, but here what we've tried to do is take each one of the uh, athletic department teams, take them apart, and look at what we expect out of them in terms of what they win, in terms of wins and losses. What are they What are they done, and what do the metrics look like in terms of graduation and progress towards a, towards a degree? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, revenues we're able to generate to make sure that each one of the teams is is self supporting uh, as best they can, and uh, if we have any issues off the field or floor. And so you have to be successful in all of those to be ultimately successful as it rolls up to the department as a whole. As far as and we'll, let's start it off with football. It's kind of interesting because. You come right in, and the 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 most headline grabbing of things is the coaching change with Coach Strong coming in. It's kind of difficult to say here's an assessment of what he's done. He just got on the job, kind of like what you did. But how about your assessment of what you've seen, what Coach Strong has done with the program, gearing it up toward his first football season? Yeah, I think it's easy to get focused uh, totally on the head coach, but I think it, it, you have to look at what the staff uh, in its entirety have done. Uh, I'm pleased about what Charlie's done in terms of getting a staff built, getting in here and getting set up. Done a great job on the tour across the country, uh, country from you know one of the state to the other. Um, I feel very good about where we're headed academics with some of the changes we've made there. You know, we made some changes in strength and conditioning. I think we're making progress there. We made some changes in the training uh, and what's going on with the staffing there. So 
you know, it's probably more like 20 or 30 people that you're, that you're really changing uh, roles and responsibilities and personnel. And I think we've made a lot of progress everywhere. You know, in talking to the faculty, they, they see a, a positive response across the campus in terms of what the student athletes, uh, how they comport themselves, how they've done in their classes. Some of the student athletes that struggled a little earlier in the fall, they've made good comebacks in the spring. You know, you look at our APR numbers, they're really good. You look at our GPA numbers that are up. Uh, so a lot of the things that have to happen have been very successful. You look at what's happened uh, in terms of ticket sales and response in that market. We're up. We're well ahead of last year where we were at this time. So that part's good. We're not having issues off the field. Um, so right now we're undefeated. <laughs> we'll see how it goes once we get to the fall. Uh, with... Uh Men's basketball, and for that matter, women's basketball as well. You talk about two programs that made big comebacks, returning yeah. to the NCAA tournament, a lot of success, a lot of excitement about that. And it, when you jumped right in, it was as men's and women's basketball were getting cranked up again and what yeah. Coach Barnes and what Coach Aston did with their programs to get them back to the NCAA tournament. I, I think both of them did a great job retooling their rosters and, and retooling the focus of their teams. Um, you know, a lot of people didn't give uh, Rick credit for the talent that he had on the roster, but I think they were a fun team to watch. Uh, they played hard every day, done a great job in the classroom, you know, got back to the NCAAs, won the first round. Uh, thank God, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to go back to Scottsdale on the golf course ever. Uh, <laughs> I remember talking to you before the game and you said, uh, this really needs to we, be in we, the win we got, we got to win this one or I'm never going to be able to play any golf again in, in the Phoenix area. But... Uh, uh, you know, then did a great job in terms of recruiting. People are excited about Miles Turner. I think we've got a lot of upside for uh, what's going to happen with men's basketball next year. Same thing on the women's side. Uh, I look for some very good things next year. Ticket sales are up. They're both doing their job uh, with their with their teams academically. You know, no issues off the floor. Always have quality folks uh, on those two rosters. So I think uh, we made a lot of progress in, in basketball this year. Uh, baseball, of course, is going to be going back to the NCAA tournament. Yep. Uh, they, it, as Augie Garrido has them back on track as well. They had a really good academic spring as well. They get ready for the Big 12 Conference Tournament as well. But your thoughts on what Augie's done with baseball? You know, I think it's it, we've made progress there. we got to finish out the rest of the season. Hopefully we can get... Uh, Go deep in the Big 12 uh, championship play. We'd like to we'd like to win that, uh, and then see what happens in the NCAA's. It's going to be tough for us to host. We'd like to be in a position to do that, but uh, uh, given our record, but I think progress there as well. And then, as far as Olympic sports go, it's always important to get your thoughts on that because. Uh, again, going back to a general overview vision of some fans, it might be out of sight, out of mind with some of them with regard to Olympic sports. But it's all part of the athletic director's responsibility, and I know those are important to you as well. Well, we've got roughly 500 student athletes in, in our athletic department. So, you know, we've got a great swimming and diving program year in and year out. Um, Reese has been there since I was a student. You know, we, we, we want to see that team be in the top three every year and challenging for a national championship. We hosted the NCAAs this year, and after a couple of days, we were leading, and Cal just beat us out on the last day. But we got a lot of young swimmers. Hopefully, they'll come back and be better next year. Golf's making progress. They're still playing, which is good. Uh, Tennis was a, was a top 10 finish in the country, so I feel good about where we're headed there. You know, you look across the board, I think we had something like seven uh, conference championships. All our men's teams made it to NCAA postseason competition. I think 17 out of 20 teams did as a whole. So I, I think the department has, has always been very strong. You know, a few of the sports uh, have struggled at times, and, and that'll happen across 20, 20 sports, but uh, a great base that uh, Delos and Chris have built here for many years, and we just want to continue to build on that. Is it, should it be, the athletic director's vision, we know what it is of the, the coaches, but the athletic director's expectation that all of his programs, both the quote-unquote major sports or the revenue sports, however folks want to classify it, mm -hmm. the Olympic sports, that all of them should be in NCAA competition on an annual basis. That's how I feel we ought to be. We, we've got tremendous athletes that we can draw from in this state. We've got great coaches. We've got great facilities. Uh, they're well supported. Uh, we ought to be very competitive across the board. We ought to be finishing near the top of the Director's Cup every year. Um, we've got 20 sports that we sponsor. We want to be very competitive in every single one.
We continue our Longhorn Weekly, and we're visiting with University of Texas Athletics Director Steve Patterson. We've uh, talked a little bit about your uh, the assessment of your athletics programs. Let me get your, your lowdown on your facilities because it has been a lot of conversation, uh, depending upon the sport and many sports yeah. with regard to their facilities, have come into this conversation. Well, we're in the midst of uh, working on our practice facility for the volleyball team so that uh, they don't have to spend as much time at Greg Jim practicing. Um, that hopefully will be done next spring. Uh, you know, you see the fences go up, and the and the tape is out there for uh, for uh, the tennis facility that'll get bulldozed shortly here for uh, for the Dell Medical School. A lot of progress that we get to drive by that, and it's great for the university. Uh, we'll be moving to uh, 51st in Guadalupe to the student rec fields. Uh, we're in the midst of trying to raise the money right now. We need about raise about 15, 16 million dollars to uh, build a new tennis facility and, uh, and outfit it with everything. But uh, I think uh, we're making progress there, a lot of good positive uh, conversations with folks. For the time being, we'll uh, resurface a number of the rec fields of uh, courts and, uh, and use those next year as we work through our process of raising the money and, and getting that built. Um, we've been uh, surveying the marketplace to talk about uh, potential new suite, club seat, low seating in a south end zone project. You know, the South End Zone project would include upgrading our football facilities. You know, our last major project there was really back in 96, which, you know, you sort of don't think about, but then you realize 96 is, you know, getting close to 20 years ago. Uh, so uh, we need some more office space. We need some more student athlete space. Uh, you've got seven schools out there that have a, a specific uh, uh, nutrition center that we don't have one. Um, and so whether we wind up doing that in the south end zone or potentially in the north end zone, uh, we certainly want to look at that as, as the NCAA rules change about uh, how you can provide food service to your student athletes. So uh, that's, uh, that's another big project that we're going to have to uh, get put together here in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And then down the road in the long run, you know, six, eight years down the road, we, we probably uh, are going to have to be in a new arena. So uh, we're at the very early stages of those conversations. Um, there are a lot of constituent groups uh, involved in that discussion. Uh, the reality is, is we've kind of been Austin's arena for the last 35 years. Uh, there's probably not a marketplace out there of uh, 2 million people, which really Austin is, is bumping up against, that, uh, that has an arena that the community hasn't invested in. So, you know, we're going to need to sit down and talk to a lot of constituent groups, you know, our coaches, our student athletes, the campus as a whole, the various community groups in any areas that we might wind up uh, landing in, the city, the elected officials and appointed officials. And so we're at the very beginnings of those conversations and ultimately that will inform what the design looks like and what the placement is and uh, and what exactly we wind up with in an arena. Let me uh, get your thoughts on some individual elements of some of the things you touched on. First of all, we'll go back to the, the, the tennis facility. First of all, as a, as a uh, former student here, do you get a little nostalgic because you were a student here when Pennick Allison was really getting into its heyday, and the Irwin yeah. Center was in its very early years as oh, well. Yeah. In the no, thought I've never that seen those basketball games at Greg Jim. <laughs> so was, you know, now we're moving on to the next buildings after them. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a bit of a change, and yeah, it reminds you that, that you got more gray hair than less. Right, exactly. Now, with with regard to. Uh, what you mentioned on the south end zone and, and the uh, the assessment, I think it's probably a lot of folks, fans think, oh, they're just looking at expanding the stadium capacity. That's right. that's that's a fan's way of looking at things. But from what you're saying is you're looking at it more from a different element, not just adding seats to a stadium. No, I don't. I don't see us really adding more seats. We're right around 100,000 seats. That's enough seats. What we do have generally uh, has been a waiting list and uh, interest in more premium seating, club seating, suite seating, low seating. Um, we have a different kind of a staff, uh, larger football staffs, larger football uh, numbers that need uh, more amenities uh, for the student athletes that we have to look at. Um, we've got our video board that's, uh, what, eight pushing 10 years. By the time we do something, it's going to be 12, 13, 14 years uh, old. It's getting harder and harder to get parts for, for uh, uh, those kind of electronics. You know, you think about your own house, you know, has anybody got an eight-year-old TV in their house? You know, I don't think so anymore. Does anybody have a 14-year-old TV in their house? Not very many folks. How do you feed a 13-year-old Godzilla-tron? Yeah, it gets harder and harder all the time. So um, 
we want to continue to enhance the fan experience in the facility. So whether it winds up being more Wi-Fi, better video, better sound systems, uh, better amenities for those folks that so we can surprise and delight them every time they, they come and interact uh, with the university and our, and our athletic facilities, all those are important elements uh, that we're going to be working on on a go-forth basis. Now, while since we're still talking football and since we're still talking facilities, uh, let me get you to transport your thoughts 200 miles north. Texas OU game, yeah. a big part of the reason that the game has continued to stay in Dallas in the Cotton Bowl was because of the commitment that the city had to begin doing the upgrades and to expand the seating capacity to 92,000. Is, is there still the ongoing dialogue of continuing to upgrade the fan amenities there and restrooms and concessions and things of that nature, as well as suites perhaps for a Cotton Bowl as they continue to try to retrofit a, a facility that started in the 1930s? Well, the reality is you're never going to be able to, to retrofit that kind of a facility to match what you've got at Oklahoma or what we have here in, in Austin. But we do want to make sure that the uh, fan experience continues to improve. Um, I think they've worked very hard at that uh, up there. It's a great tradition uh, playing there at the state fairgrounds. Um, you know, for years and years and years, we've all gone there and played the game. Uh, we want to continue that tradition. Uh, I think we're excited to continue to work with those folks, and uh, hopefully we'll get there and get a few more wins. Too. There you go. <laughs> uh, and and then finally, with regard to the Irwin Center, you mentioned it. You said six years, eight years, whatever it is down the road, but it sounds like you have your eye on the future with it. That something has to happen eventually. Obviously, with the Dell Medical Center moving in, what kinds of things happen in the very early stages when you think about what you may want to do about a basketball facility? Well, I think we really need to sit down and have a lot of conversations about what do we really expect the building to do? What are the different constituent groups that it has to uh, take care of? How do we finance it? Where do we place it? Um, you know, who's going to be our partners in it? Um, at our core, we've got to have a home for the men's and women's basketball uh, teams and for all the other events we do for the university, whether it's, you know, graduations or for uh, the school or for high schools or others. Um, you know, then you look at expanding what you do for the community as a whole. So if there's musical events or circus or rodeos or whatever else that may happen there, the state high school basketball tournament is something we want to keep uh, in the facility for many years to come, as we had for many years in the past. Uh, all those are uh, different events and diff that have different constituent groups. Uh, that have to be involved in the discussions of what is the building going to look like, where is it going to be placed, how is it going to be financed, who's going to bear those costs. Um, we're in a, in a fortuitous position right now. The building's paid for, sits on state land, we don't pay any property tax. You get a lot of great transportation uh, to, the, to the site, um, no debt service. Capital's well maintained, buildings well run, so we run slightly in the black, which is, which is rarity for a public assembly facility like that. We continue with Longhorn Weekly, and you brought it up. You said uh, commencement took place over the weekend at University of Texas. You delivered the address at the uh, law school commencement. How'd that go down? <laughs> Everything all right? That was fun. I think it's one of the things I said, you, you know, if you, if you work hard and are passionate about your job, you never know what'll happen or... You know, someday even the law school dean might call you up and ask you to <laughs> deliver the commencement address at the sunflower ceremony. And so we did it along with a good bit of help from a good friend of ours, uh, uh, Sam Hurt, who did a lot of the illustrations for us. Did, did you really enjoy it? I mean, did you enjoy it? What, what's the message to, to law school graduates since you came through it? Well, I think I just tried to talk about uh, if you're going to do this for a profession, you really have to love it and work hard at it uh, every day. Um, as long as you like the law, that's a great place to be. You may find that you don't love it as much, but you keep working hard and you never know where life will lead you. Um, you're going to get out of it uh, what you put into it. And uh, uh, I've got a lot of friends that are lawyers and stayed in the legal profession. I got others that are cartoonists or writers for the New York Times or beekeepers or you know other things out there. And Sometimes you even wander over and become athletic directors at the university. So you never know where it's going to lead you. But there, enjoy it. And have a little fun, too. There, there are always some really unique stories that come out of, of commencement with uh, some of the student athletes. 
And uh, some of the cases that came to mind for me, looking at a guy like Nathan Vasher, was just a tremendous All-American defensive back here in the early 2000s, played the NFL Pro Bowl or played in the Super Bowl. Uh, Kylie Doniak, who was just a very inspirational story with the, with the unbelievable journey she had to go through with a horrific yeah. accident and to be able to come through that. DeMarco Cobbs, a current student athlete, the linebacker. The, those are just three examples, I guess, that come to mind of the unique stories that come out of graduation. Well, I think that's something we don't do a good enough job of focusing on. Everybody kind of gets caught up in talking about whether you won or lost and and uh, the student athletes that may go on to play in the, the professional leagues. But 99.5% of our student athletes aren't going to play in the professional leagues. Even if you do go on to a professional career, your average career is less than four years. And so what we really need, I think, to be doing a better job of is telling the story of the nearly 500 student athletes that but for their college uh, uh, scholarship to play sports probably wouldn't have had the chance to go to a university, um, certainly wouldn't have been able to have a chance to go to it uh, with the level of scholarship support that they have to get the kind of support you get day in and day out from Randa Ryan and the folks in her shop and get out of here with a degree from a really great university. And so uh, we need to tell those stories more, focus on them more. And I think, you know, focus on the great outcomes. You see sometimes some kids come in here who are student athletes from very difficult backgrounds, may not have had uh, the best academic support uh, in their high schools and, and junior highs. And they come in here, they get the kind of attention that uh, we give them. They get out of here with a degree and hopefully go on to far greater outcomes, greater successes than they otherwise would have had they not come to the University of Texas. You made a, a brief reference to it earlier, but since we're on the subject of academics, APR reports just released by the NCAA, yep. all 20 of the programs at UT hitting the mark, hitting the standards as well. We know how crucial and how important that is, but to have that have a 1,000 uh, score for the football as well, I mean, th those things, like you said, are a major part of what intercollegiate athletics has to be about today, isn't it? Well, that's what, that's what we're about at UT. Um, when the football team's got a 1,000 APR and, and our current football coach is coming from the only other major school in the country that had a 1,000 APR, it shows the dedication that we've got to supporting our student athletes academically. And that's who these kids are. They're student athletes. They're not minor leaguers. They're not soon to be pros. They're student athletes by and large. You know, 99 plus percent of them are, are not gonna go on and play in the pros. You know, as much success as we've had at the University of Texas in athletics over the years, you know, we average a couple of three football players a year that, that may get to play at all in the pros. We average about one baseball player a year. Uh, we average less than a half a basketball player a year. And so when you look at those small numbers compared to the 500 student athletes that we've got every year, we need to keep in mind the rest of the 500 student athletes. We welcome you back to Longhorn Weekly, visiting with University of Texas Athletics Director Steve Patterson. Uh, one of the other key issues that we talk about is fundraising and endowments as well. You've been very public about this, talking about the, the crucial nature of it and how important it is in terms of being a lifeblood to success of an athletic program. What, what are your thoughts on where it is at the University of Texas and the things that you want to see in terms of the goal setting for fundraising and endowments? Well, DeLoss and, and Chris and the staff here have done a great job for many years leading the pack in, in, in revenues. Um, we need to continue to be in that position. We're, we, we carry a fair amount of debt. We'll carry some more with the rest of these facilities that we're going to be building. But, you know, one of the things we're, we're probably tweaking a bit is the approach towards looking at each one of the teams individually, trying to make sure they can be self-sustaining on a go-forth basis. So you have those programs that are going to generate a bunch in ticket revenue, the footballs of the world, men's basketball, baseball, uh, where we can generate quite a bit of revenue. You know, you see some growth in, in uh, volleyball and women's basketball as we go forward, but, you know, they're never going to generate as much revenue as those, other, as those other three. So, you know, the other model that's out there really is what Stanford's done over the years, and they have an endowment of half a billion dollars that supports athletics. So, you know, they can walk in their football stadium and decide that they don't like any signage in the building, and, you know, we like our signage pretty good here at, at, at UT when I was at ASU, we, you know, put a slap of sign on anything that was not moving. So, you know, to help pay the bills. But, uh, you know, so you take, a, you take a sport like a golf where you're not going to really sell any, any, any tickets. We've been very successful at it. We've got a lot of people interested in it, a lot of people that are passionate about golf. You know, so we can look at endowing each of the scholarships for the student athletes that are there. Uh, it costs a, just shy of 
of uh, just a little over three quarters of a million dollars uh, uh, in total to endow all the costs for room and board and books and tuition and fees and whatnot for a student athlete. And uh, that's a program I think that we can endow in the short home. Same thing for women's golf, uh, same thing for tennis and some of the others. Um, if you look at a school like USC, they've got 67 positions on the football team endowed, fully endowed. So these are the kind of schools that we're competing with on an annual basis. If we're gonna make those teams more self-sustaining and able to, to carry their own weight instead of putting all the weight on the back of the football program, then that's one of the, one of the tools that we can use to help support those fan base's uh, interest in those sports. You know, the reality is, in many respects, it's really being donor-centric. What are people passionate about? If somebody's passionate about uh, the rowing team, great. You know, if somebody's passionate about the tennis team, great. Uh, I think we want to try to build it across all, the, all of our sports. You know, I look out there right now, and uh, uh, we're third in the conference in endowment. I don't think Texas should be third in the Big 12 in endowment. And we're second in the, in the state to uh, school down a road that we won't mention, uh, hmm. who, who's got nearly three times as much in their sports endowment as we've got. I, we ought to be the leaders in the state. We ought to be the leaders in the conference. We ought to be one of the leaders in the nation. And uh, I think we've got the resources and the passionate fan base and the interest uh, for folks to be able to do that. So it's something we're going to continue to work on. When you say the words, uh, the, and, and I've heard you say this before, that we should get to a place where uh, we can realistically look at every athletic scholarship being individually endowed. That raises eyebrows. Is it, in today's marketplace, a realistic thing to be able to attain that goal? Oh, I think we can. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a lot of work. We've got to tell our story. We've got to tell our story well. We've got to get people interested. We've got to see what people's passion is, where they want to get involved. Uh, but I think it's a very doable uh, uh, goal uh, over the mid, or, mid to longer term. Um, and ultimately, it's, I think, where we're going to need to be as we look at all the changes and what potentially may happen in college athletics as we go forward. You, you made a brief reference to this. Uh, the, are there, and is this a, a, the way to look at it as it relates to specific sports? There are specific donors who are really dialed into a certain sport. You brought up, for example, rowing or, let's say, baseball or football, whatever, where they're specifically wanting to earmark their endowments or their donations for those sure. specific programs. Is that a route to go? Uh, it is. I think it, it, it is being donor-centric. You know, and it's the same as being customer-centric. Um, People have passions for certain sports. They, they may come to the university and care nothing about the football team. Uh, they may care nothing about the basketball team, but they may be very interested in rowing. Well, great, then let's talk about what they want to do as they plan their estate or they plan what they do charitably uh, to look at helping support that sport. Either it could be in capital for facilities, it could be on an annual basis, it could be an endowment for a scholarship, it could be an endowment for the coaching positions. It may be in the academic part of, of what's going on out there. So they may want to endow a position in, uh, in the folks that tutor our student athletes. And so if you look across what people have done elsewhere in, in college athletics, we're not doing anything that's uh, terribly outside of the box. It really is kind of uh, an accepted uh, a program. And I think it's something that we can put into place at the University of Texas, have tremendous success with, and make sure we continue to grow the sort of student services that we provide for all our student athletes across all of the 20 sports that we support. We welcome you back to Longhorn Weekly. Our special guest is University of Texas Athletics Director Steve Patterson. Uh, on to the NCAA issues, and there's some uh, real hot-button topics uh, for, for folks. Uh, NCAA governance, uh, the unionization of uh, student athletes, uh, the prospect of, of paying student athletes. I just read a story the other day about the, the Ed O'Bannon case that's uh, taken its turns. What are your thoughts on, on where things are with the NCAA? not necessarily and specifically related to the University of Texas, but in college athletics overall. Well, there's a lot of people that worked very hard to try to find a way for the more highly resourced five conferences to have more flexibility to provide the kind of student services we want to be able to provide to our students. You know, the, the possibility of that getting approved wanes and waxes on any particular week, um, I think we've absolutely got to find a way for the for those conferences to be able to operate with some more flexibility. Um, I know there's concerns amongst uh, some of the smaller schools and smaller conferences about that, but uh, but that's really I think where 
most of the legal discussions are around those conferences. Um, and if we don't find a way to do that within the NCAA framework, I think there was growing sentiment that uh, those conferences may have to find a way to do it outside. And so uh, I'm hopeful we can find it inside. Uh, but if we, ha we can't, you know, by the time we get to August and the vote on that, uh, if we don't get to where we need to get to, then I think those conferences are going to have to start to look at, at other alternatives. In terms of uh, unionization and, uh, and uh, what's going on at Northwestern, I thought it was smart lawyering. Um, you pick a private school, you have a very restricted class of only football, full scholarship uh, student athletes, uh, not walk-ons, not partial scholarships, not uh, student athletes on the other, on the other uh, teams. You know, so anytime you can define a discussion very narrowly, you can usually define it to, to come out, the, the discussion around it or the debate around it to come out in it your fit favor. fit your parameters. Yeah, to fit your, yeah, to where you want to try to get. So uh, you look at what happened there. Uh, you go in front of the NLRB. The NLRB is set up as a place for unions and management or ownership to uh, have their disputes. Um, you, if you go in front of them as the plaintiff, you're presumed to be an employee. Um, if you walk in there and you ask a student athlete, well, did they tell you where to show up? Yeah. Did they tell you what to wear? Yeah. Did they tell you what to do? Yeah. Did you get something for doing that? It's, it's a tough uh, presumption to rebut if you're Northwestern. You know, the reality is, is if you want to be an employee, your dispute is not with the NCAA or Northwestern. Your dispute is with Roger Goodell and the NFL owners and the NFL Players Association. If you want to come out of high school and go play pro football or go play pro basketball, God bless you. Go ahead. That's where you should be. Right knock, to earn a living, earn a wage. Knock yourself out. If you want to come someplace and get an education and uh, play a sport that you love uh, and have a great experience, and have your college education partially or all paid for, then come here. And uh, when I look at the list of issues that uh, were being complained about at Northwestern, at the University of Texas, we address all those, uh, but one, and that is the right to monetize somebody's image because it's uh, uh, not allowed under NCAA rules and quite frankly, I think would, would uh, tilt the playing field unfairly in different areas. You know, if we have to go out and compete for uh, helping student athletes monetize uh, their image, I got a pretty good idea what school might be pretty good at that. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think it's very good for the system as a whole. And uh, uh, so I don't support unionization. I think it's a bad idea. I think it's going to lead to uh, student athletes having their uh, uh, benefits taxed. Uh, they have to pay union dues. And really all you're doing is benefiting the one half of 1% at the very top who might have a chance at a career of four years or less in, in the major leagues, the various sports, and disadvantage the 99.5% who are trying to come here, uh, go to school, get a degree, and come out with a better outcome than they otherwise would have had. We have a few minutes remaining with UT Athletic Director Steve Patterson. One of the other topics I wanted to get to was a, a comment you made back some time ago when you first came in, and that was the, the quote that has now been kind of popularized, taking the UT brand international. What exactly is your vision of what that means as opposed to what the outside view of that might mean? Well, there's a handful of universities that really have a great national presence and some uh, international presence, and a smaller number that have that with their athletic departments as well. So uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to try to leverage the assets we've got to tell the great story of the University of Texas, both nationally and internationally, and tell a great story of our athletic department nationally and internationally. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity uh, for us to grow presence in the marketplace, to grow brand value, to grow revenues, to help our university grow uh, in terms of folks that want to uh, come into the university, be they as students or professors or donors, um, to re-engage alumni around the world. 
And so uh, we've started those discussions on a number of fronts. Uh, we have executed some agreements to go forward. We'll continue to look to execute other agreements as we go forward, but just to give you some examples. In 2015, our men's basketball program will open in China, in Shanghai. It'll be the first time in history that uh, two NCAA schools uh, ha have played a regular season game uh, in China, and uh, it's tremendously exciting for both universities and their relationships in, in, in China. Um, in 2018, we're gonna play a barnstorming tour with uh, North Carolina, Michigan State, and Florida uh, so that we can expand beyond the borders of the Big 12, which are really sort of landlocked in the, in the uh, sort of red states in the middle of the country. So we'll play in Madison Square Garden in New York. We'll play at United Center in Chicago. And then we'll finish up playing out in Los Angeles at Staples Center. So it gives us presence in each of the major media markets in this country. Uh, we'll continue to play baseball against Stanford in that marketplace. Uh, we're going to look to expand to make sure somehow we get to New York and activate that fan base uh, every year, that we can try to get to the Midwest like Chicago every year. Uh, same thing on the West Coast every year. We've had discussions about potentially playing in Mexico City and, uh, in a number of sports, including football. Uh, you know, we want to do that in a prudent fashion. Um, you know, taking into account everything needs to be taken into account as we go down there. But, you know, we have broadcast partners that are interested in that. We have merchandising partners that are interested in that. You know, I took the NBA to Mexico City back in the early 90s, and we had tremendous success, and it helped really grow the game down there. I think it's a great opportunity to us to, to grow the game of football, to grow Longhorn football. You look at the great response we had on the uh, Charlie Strong Tour down in McAllen this year. Every time we go to San Antonio, it's a great response. So uh, it's a way to help get donors engaged, alumni re-engaged, and grow the brand across the planet, and that's something that uh, we can play a role in. Yeah, it, it sounds like what you're also saying is not only is it a, a way to get the word out and the message out and the brand out, but that there is genuine excitement in foreign destinations for the University of Texas. Well, all you got to do is travel the world, and you're going to see the you're going to see the Longhorn silhouette, and you're going to see burnt orange all over the planet. You know, and just to give you an example of some other schools that, that have really leveraged it, you look at what UCLA has done. They have 70 retail stores in China right now. So it's not like we're at the leading edge of this. We're trailing a bit, and we need to catch up. Uh, if you look at what uh, Notre Dame's done, going to Ireland and playing a football game over there. Mm -hmm. They own that country. It's like a home game for them uh, when they go over there anymore. So those are the kinds of things. People want to embrace uh, American culture. Uh, the University of Texas is at the leading edge of what's great about college sports in America. And so we want to be able to extend that brand uh, around the planet. It's still early days yet, but is the job all you had hoped it would be to this point? Oh, yeah. It's been a lot of fun. It's great to see a lot of folks that... Uh, I uh, hadn't uh, seen for a long time. It's great to be back uh, uh, walking the campus and uh, and spending some time uh, in Austin and the rest of the great cities in Texas. Are, are you gonna, the, the spring sports are just about done with uh, baseball and golf still going on out there and track and field. Are you, you going to get a chance to take any vacation time before all of this starts <laughs> up again? I don't worry much about vacation. You know, the reality is we do most of our business in the off season, And so you really have to get ready for when all the student athletes come back in the fall and then just kind of hang out for dear life as you, as you play all the events and, you know, bring a million people to this campus as we do every year. What excites you most right now about University of Texas athletics? Well, I think we have great resources and we, and we have uh, a great staff. We have a great state. We've got an opportunity to grow this thing. Uh, I'm looking forward to a tremendous growth out of this department. The Lost Odds did a great job for three plus decades. Uh, I think we're only just beginning.